Hi, I'm Nora O'Donnell, and this is Person to Person. Our guest today is astronaut Peggy Whitson. With that, I'm going to turn command of the International Space Station over to Dr. Peggy Whitson. She's America's most experienced astronaut. Peggy Whitson has spent more time in space than any other American, man or woman. The 63-year-old from Iowa is not only the first woman to command the International Space Station, but she's also the only one to do it twice. In 2018, Whitson retired from NASA, but she couldn't stay away from space. Ad Astra at Godspeed AX2. Whitson blasted off with Axiom Space, a private spaceflight company. Its mission, to create the world's first commercial space station. Axiom Space also created the next generation of spacesuits that cater to different body types, especially women. Since Whitson completed more spacewalks than any female astronaut, there likely wasn't anyone more qualified to help with the design. To hear all about the future of space travel, we sat down with Whitson for an intimate, person-to-person -person conversation. Peggy Whitson, thank you so much for joining us. How are you? I'm great. It's so such an honor to be here to chat with you. An honor. It's an honor for <laughs> us to talk to you. Oh, my gosh. It's out of this world. Great. It's so good to see you. And I understand you just got back to Earth. Yeah, just a couple weeks ago. <laughs> What's harder, preparing to go to space or the reentry? Um, actually, for me, it's actually the landing. I, my body doesn't adapt well to being back in gravity. I think it just loves being in space more. <laughs> <laughs> Explain what that means. And by the way, because you've been and spent more time in space than any American ever. What's difficult about it? How does it feel? Some people, when they go into space and they're floating all of a sudden, it's like being in a swimming pool of air. Mm -hmm. um, and you're floating and doesn't take anything to move around. And so that, that makes some people nauseous or feel what we call space adaptation syndrome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> very technical term for making you not feel very good at initially. And some people, when they come back to Earth and they get exposed to gravity again, have a reaction, a similar reaction, and that's usually my end is the come home end. I don't feel so great. <laughs> yeah. And it's, I mean, but there's actual real changes to your body. I mean, oh. you're not allowed to drive. What other things? Um, well, it takes a little while to get your neurovestibular, your inner ear to work the way it does. You know, I, I was hanging up a flight suit in the car and turned my head this way and I'm like, whoa, not quite normal yet. <laughs> yeah. Just little head motions and things make, make your uh, neurovestibular system spin around a bit. But the, of course, long duration space flight has bigger impacts, you know, to bone and muscle. That's why exercise is so important on long duration missions to maintain the integrity of your bone and muscle. Mm -hmm. You retired from NASA, but then you went back to work for a private space company. Why did you do that? Well, I think, well, I might be a little bit addicted to space, but. <laughs> I, I think you're a space junkie. <laughs> I think maybe that's true, <laughs> but um, it was it was exciting to me to be a part of this change in space. You know, as the, you know, the governments have pretty much led the way in space um, because it's so expensive. But commercial entities have always existed, but now they are providing some of the leadership and taking ownership of getting satellites to orbit or people to orbit. And Axiom Space's vision is to enable the replacement for the International Space Station. As you know, it's been up there over 20 years now, and they're planning to retire it. And so we plan to step in and hopefully seamlessly um, uh, continue uh, a space station program. And that's exciting because it, we plan to increase the access to space for all countries around the world and to the scientists and um, individuals or universities that want to have access that may not have had that before. So what will this new commercial space station be like? How will it be different? <laughs> well, we wanted to maybe have a few less cables hanging out. <laughs> and, you know, it was actually originally a design that was uh, very modern at the time when it was done. 
done 20 plus years ago. Uh, and Axiom Space wants to design a station that uh, will have all that behind the walls, but we can design it from the start that way, knowing uh, what we know now, what we've learned from the International Space Station. So if someone is sitting at home and saying, like, how do, can I imagine this? Like, what, what, what is the most futuristic vision of this commercial space station? Is it kind of like we saw in 007 with lots of spaceships <laughs> docking and or in well, Star it's Wars? Even, it's yeah. even amazing just uh, the, the number of space vehicles that are docking to the International Space Station, approximately one a month, uh, sometimes more. And the, uh, the Axiom Station plans to continue that because it's going to, in, in some ways, replace some of the functions of the International Space Station. Um, I'm excited about it because I get to use my expertise to help these new, young, innovative engineers who've got these great ideas, and I get to say, yeah, that's a great one. That'll really, you know, help us in orbit, or no, that won't work in zero gravity. We need to work on that one some more. It's, it's fun to be able to use my expertise uh, to help design this. So tell us about this last mission. Yeah, the AX2 mission AX2. Uh, had, you know, a couple of really important objectives. One was to increase access uh, for private and government astronauts and uh, scientists as well. So those were the main objectives. Uh, we succeeded in doing that. We had a private astronaut, John Softner, and then two astronauts from Saudi Arabia, Ali al Karni and Rayana Barnawi. Um, Rayana, interestingly, was the first Arab woman uh, to fly into the International Space Station and, you know, conduct research. And that's her uh, background is biomedical research. And mm -hmm. so she got to do cell culture research in orbit. Uh, so that was very exciting for her. It it's, inspires people around the world to see others like them. Mm -hmm. And I understand that you, there was some cancer research that was going on. Yeah, that's one of my favorite experiments. Uh, we were looking at ways to, tr potential ways to treat different types of cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, we had colorectal cancer and breast cancers, and uh, we, we really feel like the, those uh, research objectives are gonna help develop medical therapies here on the ground. So we're very excited to hear about the details of the research. What is the future of space travel? Is there a time where any American could go to space if they wanted to? I envision it very much like commercial aviation back in the day when it was first getting started. It, you know, originally it was very much a government-oriented uh, operation through the military and then through the mail system. Uh, and then commercial aviation developed after that. Eventually, it allowed us to uh, have people who almost anyone can get a, a flight on an aircraft now. And I envision that, that opening up that access opening up the industry and the, adding additional purposes uh, for having a presence in space is going to increase humanity's access, which I think is really exciting. How long away is that? Well, I don't, my crystal ball is not always accurate. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I really do uh, want to see a, a place where more and more people are going, and there will be for different reasons. Axiom Space is promoting access to space for governments and countries, but we're also, you know, part of the reason I'm so interested in hoping to develop uh, research and actual manufacturing in space. Yeah. You know, using space as a tool. That lack of gravity is really a great tool when it comes to things like these cancer studies, and uh, it'll, it'll enable us uh, for pharmaceutical companies to jump in and start manufacturing things that are going to be of value on Earth. This is so fascinating, because I think some people may say, oh, this space travel, it's just a joy ride. What's the point of it? Seems very expensive. I sat down a couple of years ago with Caroline Kennedy, who's, of course, father, John F. Kennedy, helps launch Americans into space, and Jeff Bezos, who, as you know, has his own company. And one of the ways that Jeff Bezos describes space to me is the future will do all manufacturing, all the stuff that is bad for the environment, garbage, everything will be on, out in space on a different planet so that we can keep the Earth pristine. And that kind of blew my mind about the thinking of, like, how Earth will be, you know, in a hundred years for perhaps my grandchildren. How do you see it? 
Well, I definitely think being in space gives you this really novel perspective of what it's like. You look down and all of humanity, except for the handful of people that are around you in the space station, lives on this planet, at least mm -hmm. as far as we know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all of humanity. So you get this really uh, great perspective of how important, how special it is. You know, it provides our oxygen, removes a lot of the carbon dioxide, maybe not enough, right? but, and you know, it provides us a temperate environment. It protects us from radiation. And here we are out in space trying to develop this. And I like to think of Earth as our spaceship. Mm. And yes, we need to protect that planet because it is our spaceship in what, when you look out to see all these stars, you're like, it's thousands and thousands of stars and this is one universe and there are billions and billions of universes out there and I am just in awe of that perspective that you gain from being in space. But the, the more practical application of space is, you know, did you check the weather today? Did you use your GPS? These, these are everyday things to us. And uh, it's they that only exist because of space. Yeah. Exactly. It's the technologies that we develop to answer hard problems. The innovation that's required is really what's so important about going into space. And it benefits us here mm -hmm. on this planet. Yeah, enormously so. All right, when we come back, we will speak more with Peggy Whitson about the lessons learned from her incredible groundbreaking career. Nobody else has done what she's done when we come back. We're back with Peggy Whitson. So when did you decide you wanted to be an astronaut? Uh, I was nine years old when the first astronauts, uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, walked on the moon. And at the time, I thought, cool job. I want to do this, too. But as a farm kid in Iowa, and I, was, I never really told anybody about it because it seemed so unreal to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, coincidentally, when I graduated high school was the first year NASA picked the female astronauts, a class of female astronauts. What so, year was that? 1978. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, very meaningful to me because among them, you know, Sally Ride, mm -hmm. obviously, who's, we we're in her 40 year anniversary for her first flight this year. And she, and the other ladies, especially the ones that, you know, Shannon Lucid was a biochemist, and I'm like, I'm interested in biochemistry. And I'm like, maybe this is possible for me to become an astronaut. Luckily, I had no idea how hard it would be, <laughs> but I set my mind to it. <laughs> and, you know, uh, after I got my PhD in biochemistry, I uh, started applying immediately uh, to become an astronaut. And, uh, you know, was rejected and rejected and rejected every couple of years. <laughs> you were rejected four times, right? Yes, so over eight years, and then it was in the 10th year that I was finally uh, selected and interviewed. Um, I, I, it's interesting, you know, looking back now, I can have the perspective of saying that uh, at the time, I really wanted to be an astronaut. I really thought it was important for, you know, they need me now, because <laughs> yeah. I wanted to be. Uh, but those 10 years were the years that I learned uh, leadership, teamwork. I was negotiating with Russians on uh, big science uh, programs that we were doing jointly together, and it gave me the experience base that once I was selected as an astronaut, yeah, I was qualified and had some experience working with these teams um, to be selected as the first female commander of the International Space Station, and then to be selected as the leader of the astronaut office, first female and first non-military, to be selected in that role. And those experiences uh, were really important. And I, I try and tell young people, it's, it's so important to take advantage of the opportunities you're given along your path, because getting there isn't always a straight line. But, but I want to ask you more, because four times being rejected. <laughs> Most people give up after being rejected just once. Mm -hmm. um, no less four times. What is a lesson that someone can learn from you about that grit, that resilience, that passion that you clearly have um, to become an astronaut? Well, I, I think it is, there's a lot of resilience involved. Uh, growing up on a farm in Iowa, I think, teaches you and trains you that resilience. So I think that was helpful to me, there, you know, that 
if you didn't have a, a solution that you could go buy at the store, you had to make up one and to make whatever broke work. Yeah. And you know, I saw that my whole life growing up. Um, and I felt like that was the natural thing. Okay, what do I need to do next to make So you didn't take it personally, the rejection? Uh, well, I mean, it's hard not to take it a little personally. <laughs> but uh, You just thought it was part of the journey, part of the work. Well, I, I yes, and I had an extremely supportive husband who kept encouraging me, no, don't give up if you're not ready to give up. That's mm -hmm. not the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And so it, that helped. I, I mean, having somebody in my corner, but it was also just hanging in there and knowing, hey, this is right for me. I'm not quitting. And now you hold the distinction of the most space walks by a woman, the most time spent in space by any American ever. Mm -hmm. I mean, what haven't you done, Peggy? <laughs> Well, let's see. I could go for the moon. I'd, I'd, I'd have fun doing that one. Yeah. <laughs> but there's there's just a lot of opportunities, I think, as, as space is changing so much. I think there are lots of ways to contribute and be a part of that. I think it's part of the reason I like to keep going back, besides the addiction of this perspective, but is I, I really like being a part of something bigger than me. And this space truly is that. And the objectives in space are that. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very excited about continuing. If you look back at the almost 250 year history of America, women have played such an important role, but they don't always get the spotlight or the recognition or the statues of them in town squares or on <laughs> Capitol Hill. What do you think about the contribution of women to American history and innovation? Oh, I, I think it's huge. I mean, even just looking at NASA history, you know, the, the hidden figures um, was really impressive to see human computers, most of them women, <laughs> were doing all the calculations to get us to the moon by hand. I just, I find that I still get the chills. I yeah. know. I still get the chills on that. And yet we, we weren't taught that in school. No. no. And you probably, did you know about it until no. you'd read the book and seen I the movie? I, I read the book and I was just in awe of it. I was thrilled they made a movie out of it. And what does that tell us about women's contributions and particularly in the, in getting us to space? I, I just think, you know, women have always contributed and maybe it's, you know, societal or whatever that we don't acknowledge that. Uh, I think we're getting a lot better at it. Mm -hmm. um, we have female anchors, <laughs> female still astronauts. Still very few of them. Yeah. <laughs> we're still trying to break through. We will. What is so inspiring about space? You know, I've tried to capture it, that in words, but um, the biggest thing for me is perspective. Mm -hmm. I talked to you about the planet, um, but you know, if you think about it, coming from a farm, uh, you know, my whole world was that farm, then, then it was the little town I went to high school in, and then expanded to another city where I went to college, and then I moved out of state and, you know, expanded to two states, and then I started traveling to Russia to do negotiations and it became the United States. And then when I left the planet, it became the planet was my home. Yeah, wow, what incredible perspective. All right, when we come back, we'll talk to Peggy Whitson about whether this past space mission will be her last or there's more ahead, that's next. We're back with Peggy Whitson, who has spent more time in space than any other American. Will you go back? Absolutely. I sure hope I can. Yeah. I would love to. And will the company that you're with now, Axiom Space, will there be another space mission? What will it be for? There are multiple space missions planned prior to uh, the Axiom Station, and then we'll continue and have further missions after Axiom Station and, uh, is built. Uh, initially, we'll be attached to the International Space Station, mm -hmm. uh, and, but w before the International Space Station is deorbited um, and burned up in the atmosphere, we'll undock 
and we'll be independent uh, on our own uh, in space. So that is, uh, you know, a few years out, not that many, hopefully. Um, is there a target date for this new commercial space yes, station? Yes, yes. So we'll start building in uh, late 2025 or 26. So we're right on the cusp there. Uh, I'm excited that we'll get, you know, a couple of modules up there pretty quickly. We hope to have four before uh, the International Space Station is deorbited in 2030. Wow. Yeah. So. And then what will that mean in terms of commercial space travel? Will that be the thing that really catapults um, more of the travel? You know, there's going to be, I think, the commercial industry will have people and places, destinations in space have, that might be for visiting. But our objective is for that that goal of um, research and manufacturing, things that are products that are going to be used back on Earth, um, and to expose more and more people uh, and countries and institutions and commercial companies to this access. Mm -hmm. uh, we even plan to have a, a special module that will be used for filming film crews and stuff. You'll have to come and visit and do, do your news from there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've done a lot of things, but I've never been to space, so maybe that's one idea. Yeah. <laughs> You've broken so many records. William Shatner became the oldest person in space at the age of 90. Would you want to break that record? As long as I can be physically fit, mentally fit, I'd love to. Yeah. Well, Peggy, it is such a pleasure to talk to you and to follow your career. You are such an inspiration to so many Americans and of course, so many women and girls. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.